If you are here, you have taken an active role in bettering your life, no matter what stage of life you are in. The Banyan Treatment Center's podcast will discuss many topics like recovery, addiction, self-help, mental health, and so much more. It will provide you with tools to succeed, ideas for recovering, and how-tos on creating a better life. My name is Alyssa, and today's episode is about receiving treatment for an eating disorder. Today on our panel, we have Tammy Gangloff. Tammy has over 15 years of experience working with the eating disorder community. She is a marriage and family therapist, works doing outreach for eating disorder treatment, volunteers on countless coalitions, and has the personal experience with recovering from an eating disorder as well. Her efforts have helped thousands of clients and their families on the path of healing. Tammy, thank you so much for joining us today. Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Thanks so much, Alyssa. I'm really excited to be here today. So, wow, you said so many great things already. I appreciate that awesome introduction. <laughs> so, yeah, a little bit about me. I live in Pennsylvania, I'm moving actually shortly to the Lancaster area. And, um, yeah, I've been working in the field for about 15 years. But as you said, you know, my own recovery led me to go back to school and become a marriage and family therapist. I've also been sober for longer than I've recovered from my eating disorder, so I am grateful to be recovered from both, and I'm really excited to be able to use that personal experience to have a chance to help others. Awesome. Well, I'm very excited to hop into this topic and educate people about eating disorders. According to the National Association of Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders, eating disorders affect at least 9% of the worldwide population. Suffering from an eating disorder can cause individuals to feel isolated and misunderstood, especially by those that believe this disease is a choice. The prevalence of this disease has affected the lives of millions of people, and the issue continues to grow. Although overcoming this disease may not be easy, recovery is possible. Today, we're going to discuss the reality of recovering from an eating disorder and how to navigate life in eating disorder recovery. So our first question is, how does one typically develop an eating disorder? Is there a pattern, common factors in society that can encourage one to develop? What was your experience? So I'll say from my personal experience, but also, you know, I think just like any other type of addiction or process addiction, there really isn't any one path to developing an eating disorder. There definitely are some things that can um, play a hand in it, right? There's some, what of a genetic component. A um, lot of great research around that, the genetics um, playing a role in it. For right. myself, I would say that, you know, I had a history of some abuse in my childhood. I also wore a back brace for scoliosis when I was, you know, 12, 13, 14. So that definitely led to some body image, self-image issues. I was always very kind of quiet and shy. Mm -hmm. Um, experienced some bullying, which is also something that's common in a lot of eating disorder clients. They may have experienced some bullying. So those were some of the factors that definitely led to me developing an eating disorder. And then, you know, it kind of persisted into early adulthood as well. The perfect storm. The perfect storm, exactly. And then there's some clients that I've had that had an amazing childhood and didn't have any trauma. So although it's really common in our clients. We don't see it in everybody. There also is, you know, a certain temperament that may lead to eating disorders. There's definitely perfectionism. There's a myth that it's all about control. I think that there's definitely a control component to it, but that's not the main component to it. There's so many underlying factors. So it's safe to say that somebody with an eating disorder can fully recover or do you ever consider yourself fully recovered? Yes. Great question. I know that there tends to be a little bit of controversy um, in, in the different recovery realms, so to speak, about that terminology. Um, what I'll say, and I should send it to the, the definition of recovered that I go by is actually the one that was developed by the founder of a program that I worked for for many years. And she's somebody that was a mentor of mine um, that talks about what recovered really means. Um, And I will say that our, you know, our 12 step friends, I like to say it says in the big book recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I, I use the word recovered um, for a lot of reasons, 
Recovered to me means it's been 20 years since I have used my body in any way with restricting or using any eating disorder symptoms to deal with how I feel, to deal with my life, to deal with any stress in any way, sadness, depression. So to me, recovered means it's really just something that was a part of my life that's no longer a part of my life now. You know, years ago in eating disorder treatment, there was the belief that this is something that you're going to struggle with every day. And that's just not true. Um, And it's not only not true for me, but for so many people that I've met, whether they are colleagues or former clients, really living this full life many years beyond an eating disorder. So yes, I believe that anyone can become fully recovered, no matter how entrenched you were in your eating disorder, no matter how sick, how many years it lasted, um, being fully recovered is possible for anyone. I love that. And you said that you've been in a recovery of your eating disorder for 20 years? Yes. Actually, I was thinking back the very last time. So I I, so I celebrated 25 years of sobriety in May. Um, and Congratulations. I was around. Thank you so much. I feel so old when I say that. Um, <laughs> we used to joke around in young people's meetings. If you stay sober, you're not going to be the young person anymore. So I'm grateful that I'm not the young person anymore. And, you know, it was eating disorder treatment that sent sent me to my first AA meeting. It was then in my early recovery, my early sobriety that I then went back to go to treatment for the last time, which was, you know, a a PHP and IOP. And that was literally 20 years ago right now. It was 2002. So a very long time ago. So what does the treatment process look like for someone who has an eating disorder? Uh, Is it different for different types of eating disorders? Is there like a common therapy that's best practice when it comes to treating eating disorder? Yes, great question. So there definitely um, are a lot of evidence-based treatment modalities that are used in eating disorder treatment. Um, my, my colleague likes to say we use all the T's. <laughs> <They're> just, <laughs> so um, CBT is absolutely evidence-based. Um, ACT in, in treatment in the higher levels of care, like we have here, we do a lot of exposures, um, whether that be in the mm-hmm. kitchen um, it might be clothes shopping and maybe um, cooking a meal together. So a lot of exposure therapy uh, for sure. Because there is a lot of trauma, we definitely will utilize some of the evidence-based treatments for trauma as well, whether that's EMDR um, or another type of modality. Um, and so there's um, a lot of use of DBT skills as well, mindfulness, um, teaching intuitive eating. And what would you say are some some triggers in the eating disorder uh, recovery? You know, how do we stay away from these triggers outside of treatment? Great question. Everybody has different triggers. And I'm just thinking of some clients I've spoken with even just over the last week. Like for somebody, um, and you actually, in your last question, I didn't fully answer. You asked if there were different treatments used for different eating disorders. And so the, the kind of the broad answer is no. Typically, we're using the same treatment modalities. However, the interventions will definitely be different based on each client's individual struggles. So, uh, for example, I'm thinking of a, a client that's struggling with binge eating disorder that might be, you know, fearful of going through, you know, a fast food mm-hmm. drive through because that might be a way that they binged before. That might be a trigger. And then throughout treatment, we will slowly get back to addressing that. So that maybe we do that as an exposure is going through the drive through together and ordering a meal instead of um, an amount of food to binge on. Yeah. So the interventions are going to look very different. Um, I'd say a lot of times, you know, the triggers come from social media, right? So we're doing a lot of talk about social media. A lot of it can come from just our friends and family. And so we do a lot of conversations about boundary setting and how do we reinforce those boundaries so people aren't making comments about your body, how to teach people how to give us compliments without talking about our bodies. I think that's um, a whole societal thing, not just for someone with an eating disorder, but that comment about body can be so detrimental to recovery. Uh, Like if you said to somebody in recovery, you look really healthy, someone with an eating disorder is going to turn on and think you just said that they're fat, right? That's usually how that um, is internalized when, you know, your best intention might be, wow, you, you have light in your eyes again. You seem like you have energy again. Um, It's really hard to hear. Um, any comments about body. Um, Other triggers could just be, you know, going to the grocery store, going out to eat, 
So again, in treatment, we try to address a lot of those things. Um, and then even after treatment in outpatient therapy, working with a therapist, dietitian, or recovery coach that, that can continue to do those exposures with you. I love that you brought up social media too, because one of the things that we try to encourage people is if social media is triggering for you, which it can be triggering in many different conditions, not just eating disorder, mental health disorder, maybe, maybe even addiction. I mean, it just depends on your situation, but cultivating your feed to provide you with the healthiest things for you to, to see if that's a trigger for you, you know, following positive pages making sure that you're not following old people, places, and things that maybe trigger you, you know, and being mindful of that. Absolutely. I think changing your feed is so important. It can make such a big difference. And then in treatment, you know, if somebody's really struggling, sitting down with the phone with somebody and doing that, right? Like changing the Mm -hmm. feed. And, you know, I think we all do it. Sometimes I even do it myself, right? Take a social media break. Even if it's just for two days, it can make a really big difference. So, Um, Yeah, definitely shifting that. There's so many great recovery pages on Facebook and Instagram. I don't want to do Twitter, but there's so many great recovery pages to follow that there's plenty to replace that old feed that might feed into that negativity. So how can one manage a healthy lifestyle while refraining from negative perceptions about food? It depends on what your description of healthy lifestyle is. Mm -hmm. Um, For me, when when you say that, I'm thinking healthy lifestyle would be a good balance of everything, right? So balance with, um, you know, with work, spending time with friends and family, movement. Um, Movement, I think, is something important that isn't talked about uh, enough in recovery. And again, I think we do a really good job of it here. And so having a good balance of all of that and being able to utilize your healthy coping skills in the midst of all that, which is honestly a really tall order, right? So, you yeah. know, having, you know, a team and somebody to walk through all that with, um, starting with, you know, talking through, you know, we call it the eating disorder, healthy self, like what are your eating disorder and negative self-image thoughts? What are your healthy responses, which is a very kind of CBT thing to do. Um, and then really discovering for yourself, what is the balance of, um, you know, movement, um, nourishment, you know, whether that's physical, emotional, spiritual, food, spending time with friends and family, what's the balance that works for you because it's something different for all of us. Um, And so part of that, you know, we start out with treatment is, you know, teaching you what your body needs as far as fuel, what what kind of, what foods does your body need? Um, How much of it does your body need? We don't talk about specific calories and numbers because that can be really triggering. Um, So really Mm -hmm. teaching somebody what, what your plate looks like so that you know how to nourish yourself and that you can continue to do it when you go home. And the same thing with movement, right? What does healthy movement look like for you? Some people might come into treatment with uh, a compulsive exercise history or someone might be an elite athlete, right? So how, do you, how can you nourish your body if you're an elite athlete? Um, if you're somebody who had compulsive exercise, we're going to take a look at that and discover how do we uh, incorporate exercise into your life in a more balanced way. Um, and looking at what is we call it joyful movement. So maybe I, I know a lot of runners and um, I like to run when I can. And so um, are you running? That's the questions I would ask them. Are you running because it, you want to lose weight or are you running because you like how you feel? And so really digging in and discovering what those things mean to you. And then the same thing with your relationships, right? One of my favorite assignments um, I do is how is your relationship with food like your relationship with people that comes from Carolyn Costin, eight keys recovery from an eating disorder book. Um, We use that a lot in treatment as well, but kind of really digging in and figuring out the why behind all the things that we're doing so that we can slowly shift over time and finding that life balance. I love what you said too, about making sure you're nourishing your body when it comes to the food perspective and maybe the exercise perspective, because you know, someone with an eating disorder is trying to develop that, you know, healthy relationship, but continue to also nourish their bodies, you know? So like dieting, for example, like one of the questions I was going to ask is, is it acceptable to diet for someone in with an eating disorder or in recovery of an eating disorder? But I guess uh, the better way to look at it is that they're learning how to nourish their body in an appropriate manner 
Absolutely. That's a great way to say it. I mean, I'm going to answer it in two parts. Right? Mm-hmm. So I thought the first part is, you know, when somebody comes into treatment from an eating disorder, you know, there, there typically is loss of sense of hunger and fullness. And so we okay. don't really know how to nourish our bodies if we, if we don't have a sense of hunger and fullness. So we might do that with using a hunger and fullness scale. There's a lot of great ones out there. I like to do, you know, a zero to 10 scale. And so when it's time to eat, you should be really no, no more hungry than a two or three on the scale. If you're further down, you've gone too long without eating. Um, and then, you know, if you're more than a seven, you might have overeaten and might feel too full. And so we'll do that by checking in before and after each meal. And for quite a long time in treatment, someone might say, I don't feel hungry or full. Um, and so the goal is then eating meals and snacks so that your body starts to relearn that. Um, once your body relearns that and you continue to eat, then we can look at what, what your body actually is doing with the food. Um, because some clients come to treatment needing to restore weight. Uh, some clients come needing to maintain, and typically it's really healing their metabolism. Um, weight loss is not a goal for treatment. The goal is to restore health, and then what your body does once it's restored to health is different for everybody. So if somebody is in a larger body and they start to lose weight as a result of eating normally, um, then that's one one thing that happens for them, but it's not a treatment goal. So to the the question about dieting, I would say for anyone that's in early recovery from an eating disorder, that's not something that we would do. Um, Mm -hmm. We wouldn't, you know, talk about dieting. If somebody's been in recovery for a longer period of time, and when I say that, I mean, you know, several years into good solid recovery, um, you know, if somebody wants to diet, I'm always going to ask the question, you know, what's behind that, right? That's what we do is, you know, what's behind the, the desire for diet? Is it, I want to have more energy to play with my kids? Um, you know, I don't feel very good. Um, maybe there's some medical, you know, my blood pressure is high. And my doctor thinks that it has to do with weight. Um, so there's always a conversation about what's going on medically. What's the reason behind it? Um, if it seems appropriate for this client, I would say they need to see a dietitian, a dietitian that has eating disorder experience and, you know, to talk about that process. Um, I have seen that happen, you know, with several clients that are further along in recovery, um, but only with the help of the dietitian that really specializes and can help them do that in a healthy way. Um, early recovery, and I'm thinking the first couple of years, it's too slippery of a slope. It's that gray area. Mm-hmm. And it would be too easy to, you know, a lot of times it starts with skipping a snack or skipping a meal. Um, You know, once we're fully recovered, you're eating intuitively, right? You're listening to your body. You're eating when you're hungry, stopping when you're full. I always say you're eating more sometimes because you're celebrating with friends or family or because, you know, the food tastes good. Um, And then your body regulates itself, right? If I have more movement yesterday, I'm probably going to be more hungry today. And so I listen to that and, you know, honor what my body is asking for. I love the way you put that. Um, So are there resources? I know you were talking about this one book that you guys use Mm -hmm. in treatment. Uh, Are there additional books or additional resources or maybe support groups that you want to uh, tell us about? Yeah. So the, um, the National Alliance for Eating Disorders. Um, is one of my go-tos. Um, I am also um, a co-facilitator for their virtual groups and kind of an alternate for in-person groups. But the Alliance for Eating Disorders has been around for over 20 years, and all of our groups are co-led by recovered, not rec- all recovery clinicians, some recovered, but all clinicians. Um, and that's a great resource, whether you're in Florida and you can do some things in person or virtual groups. Uh, Because even post-COVID, our virtual groups are continuing. Um, There are groups for uh, clients, for family members, LGBTQ-specific groups. There are a lot of different treatment centers, obviously, out there um, as well. Um, The Eight Keys to Recovery from an Eating Disorder is unbiased, but (laughs) that's where I trained. But um, it's an amazing book and workbook that I recommend to everyone. There's also books on, um, you know, intuitive eating as well. Other resources, the National Eating Disorders Association, um, they also have a helpline. We do eating disorder awareness um, walks with them throughout the year. Um, The Eating Disorders Coalition, if you are an advocate at heart like I am, um, if you have not advocated in your state capital or in DC, um, I highly recommend coming um, with us. I think we go in May next time. 
but, you know, we have seen a lot of things change over the years. And that comes from not only professionals coming in and telling their stories, but somebody coming in that might still be struggling and really, you know, telling their story to make change on that other level. So there's a lot of really great organizations out there. And I'm happy to give you some that you can maybe post also. Yes, absolutely. Multi-Service Eating Disorders Association. Um, They're based in Boston, but really similarly, they also have free groups. Um, That is an amazing Instagram page to follow. Monica does Instagram lives with people in recovery, um, as well as other clinicians. Um, Rock Recovery is another one that offers um, free support groups and um, and then Project Heal as well. So there's so many great organizations out there. Our field is so fortunate that it's grown so much. You know, when I went to, the first time I went to treatment for my eating disorder in 1995, there weren't really any resources at all other than, you know, a couple of treatment centers in the country. So we're so fortunate that we've grown so much in the resources we have available. And then for professionals, there's the International Association for Eating Disorder Professionals, and there's chapters all over the world. In our area here in Pennsylvania, there's the Greater Philly IADEP chapter and then another chapter that we just started in directly in Philly, the Southwest Philly chapter. So yeah, a lot of great things that we're, we're working on. I just love how passionate you are about it. I mean, you, <laughs> you can just tell you've been doing this for so long. It's second nature to you. And, you know, you just, you live and breathe it. Thank you so much. You know, I, I you know, I did work uh, at a rehab for a few years and I learned a lot from that, but there's just something about working in the eating disorder field with the, the, the other, the colleagues that we have that are equally as passionate and really seeing, you know, our clients grow and fully recover. Um, and I know we see that on the other sides of our field too, right? Definitely see that in the substance, substance use side, but it, it's just a part of who I am. And I just um, love it so much. And I feel so fortunate to be able to, you know, do everything I can to continue to help people recover. And, you know, I love what we're doing here at our program. Um, you know, it's, it's still newer as far as eating disorder programs grow, but we have such a strong team and program and I'm just, you know, excited to be a part of it and help, help grow. Yeah, absolutely. And what I wanted to ask you too, because you do know so much is what is like the most common misconception for people that don't understand eating disorders? Like what would you like the public to know about when it comes to supporting someone with an eating disorder that maybe is not so common for outsiders to understand? Oh, there's so many things. (laughs) <laughs> I think, I mean, one of the main ones I think of is size. Like I mentioned, you know, some people with an eating disorder are at a lower body weight, but that's not the most common. A lot of people with eating disorders are, you know, quote, average size or in larger bodies. And so it's really all body sizes. And so I think that's a big misconception. Mm-hmm. Um, the others are that, you know, it's, it's only body image or, you know, I, I love that, you know, if you could just eat something, if we can just get her to eat, well, it's not about just getting somebody to eat. There's so many other factors. Um, but I think the, the body size and body image piece is the biggest one, especially even with medical providers. I think that's where a lot of people's eating disorders um, go unnoticed. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also there's the gender piece, which I could talk about forever that, you know, gender is going into, you know, see the doctor, um, some are diagnosed with eating disorders, some are not. So I think the that piece and then also just the fact that, and we know this from, you know, even just mental health and substance use treatment, going to treatment once doesn't mean your eating disorder is fixed. And just because you look okay on the outside does not mean that you're okay. So just because somebody might be weight restored does not mean that they're recovered. So I think that's to me one of the biggest ones, but there's so many. Yeah, Absolutely. So what would you say to someone who is struggling with an eating disorder or maybe a family member is listening to this right now because their loved one is struggling? I would say that, and I said this to a young lady earlier today who just is kind of at her wit's end and, you know, is really just, I can't do this. And what I'll say is that, you know, I I believe that everybody has the capacity to recover, fully recover, and that, you know, it's one of the hardest things that you'll ever do. And we do see people fully recover all the time. So you may feel like you're stuck and you're lost and alone. Um, But, you know, help is here, whether it's in the form of coming to a treatment center or talking to somebody else who's recovered or logging into a group and listening to people talk that, 
you know, recovery is something that we can't do alone. And so just know that you're not alone and that there's so much support here for you. And just let us, I would say, you just have to show up, right? Whether that's showing up means logging into a Zoom meeting um, or making a phone call to, to get help. All you have to do is show up and let us do the rest. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Tammy. I really learned a lot myself just from having this conversation with you. And I think that, you know, we're really going to be able to educate a lot of people with this episode. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for taking the time to um, write those amazing questions and take the time to speak with me. And I'm always happy to, to chat about this anytime. Thank you so much. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. Remember that growth and recovery are possible and it can all start today. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Banyan Treatment Centers and make sure you're subscribing for notifications of new episodes. And please don't forget to leave us a review. If you or someone you know are struggling, call us today at 888-515-7706. Thanks for joining us today on the Banyan Podcast.